Alrighty. Um, okay. The idea here, this is too big. The idea here is I'm going to rapidly run through uh, some of the solutions for the in-person handouts. I'm not going to worry about calculating numbers. I'm more or less just going to set up the problem for you in case you need it or you would like to review these problems uh, as you prepare for the exams, uh, be it exam three or the final. So I'm doing 15, 16, 17, and 18, so all the rotation ones. And I won't necessarily do all of them either, uh, if there are multiple like this one. For each joint below, identify where they think the center of mass is. So again, the center of mass is the balancing point where you could put your finger if you were imagine each of these connected by, you know, a thin wire, you know, with a thin plate or something, you know, where could you put your finger to balance these four? Or in this case, you know, a wire with three in a row. Here it's kind of a triangle. And here it's kind of three in a row. So in this case, by symmetry, I would say the center of mass is in the center here. Um, again, because there's, you know, for the particle that's over here, there's a similar particle that's over here. By symmetry, their, mid, their midpoint is in the center. And similarly for these two. Similarly, by symmetry, the center of mass is here. By symmetry, the midpoint is probably somewhere like right here. If you were to balance, you know, where is the middle of that triangle? And then here, there's more mass on the left than the right, so I would say the center mass is probably right about there. Then calculate the center of mass given these numbers. Let me do an actual 2D one, so I'll do the triangle. So you have a triangle that looks like this. Um, each of these are separated a distance d apart. And the idea that the center of mass is defined as the sum of the mass weighted positions divided by the total mass. There are three particles, so the, the numerator is just 3m, uh, where m is 2 kilograms. And then the denominator is a vector expression, so I can evaluate the numerator, sorry, the numerator rather, uh, in both the x direction and the y direction. So I could do m r x, and then the sum of m r y for the center of mass in the x direction and the center of mass in the y direction. And then each of those are divided by 3m. So for the triangle in the, um, let's see, oh, the tick marks are one or one meter apart, I'm sorry. So this is D, that's D, um, that is D, yeah, there we go. So in the X direction, I look at what is the X coordinate for all three of these particles. So it looks like it's M times negative D plus m times negative d, the two on the left, then plus m times d for the one on the right. A horizontal distance either of negative d and d. You know, and one of these cancel. So the center of mass is negative md in the x direction. In the y direction, the upper left one is at a height of zero. And then there's plus m, and that one's, uh, looks like it's minus d down. And then the second one is also minus d down. So this is minus 2 md. In the uh, vertical direction. So in this case, it looks like the center of mass is uh, minus md divided by 3m in the x direction, comma, negative 2 md divided by 3m in the y direction. This looks like it is the m's cancel negative d over three comma negative two d over three. And then if d is one, this is negative one third meter and negative two thirds meter. All right, uh, center of mass changes only because of external forces an object explodes into pieces. The center of mass will match the location of what it was before fragmenting. 
All right, so it's first draw a cannonball, a cannon launches, you know, say it's a cannon or a firework or something like that. Um, if it launched it up at some angle, it would come up, come back down. Then step two says, suppose when the ball is at the highest point, half of it breaks and falls vertically downward, the remaining half continues moving, trace the path to the center of mass of the two pieces. So if instead we had two things that broke apart at the highest point, one of them is going straight down. I can already say something about the center of mass of the system. Again, because the system itself is the cannonball, when they break apart into pieces, whatever is causing the cannonball to break apart is happening inside the system. So there's no net external force. Whatever forces are involved are all internal to the system. So the center of mass, nothing changes about the path that the center of mass takes. As a result, the other piece has to go out and some additionally have some hor additional horizontal motion as it goes towards the right. So that if I know that say the particle is located here and the other half is located here, I should be able to calculate the center of mass of those two pieces. You know, again, m r r divided by this by m, and I better get the original path that I had before. You know, the center of mass does not change, even when it goes from one piece to two pieces. I can always calculate the center of mass of the two individual pieces and get back what I had originally. Consider a can of cola, draw and identify where the center of mass is located. So it's a full can of cola. So it's filled to the brim with stuff. The center of mass, therefore, by symmetry, is right at the center of the can. Uh, again, it's kind of the balancing point, the tipping point, where if you took the average of all the mass, where is it located? Suppose you start to drain the can and, it, and the height descends at a constant rate. If we're just considering the, the liquid that's in the water, um, sorry, the liquid that's in the water, the liquid that is in the can, uh, how is the center of mass changing? So the height of the top of the water is dropping. And we're considering, you know, the, the, if we're only considering the liquid, we're only considering kind of what makes up and is filled inside the can. Again, by symmetry, the center of the, ma the center of mass is always in the center of, you know, between the bottom of the can and the top of the liquid, uh, since we're not considering the can. So if the height is reducing down by dh by dt, and the center of mass is always in the center, in order for the center of mass to always be in the center, it must be descending at a rate that is one half dh dt. If it's descending half as fast, it's always in the center between the bottom and the top. And then as the height of liquid you know, descends to zero, they all ultimately end up converging on one another. Mm -hmm. Four scenarios are given below. Identify the axis of rotation, draw that as a dashed line, draw what direction, omega points. So this is the right hand rule. This you are then just looking. for the direction of the angular velocity, which the angular velocity itself is a vector that points in a straight line. So in this case, omega points straight up because I can point my thumb straight up and curl my fingers in the same direction that the dancer is spinning. For the merry-go-round, it appears like they are rotating in a clockwise direction. So I can ask if I curl my right hand finger so that they curl clockwise on, on the page, my thumb points into the screen, so mega points into the screen. 
The record player is the same as the spinning dancer, except that it's spinning in the opposite direction. So in this case, I would say omega points uh, downward, not upward. Again, if we were to take a bird's eye view of this, it would look like it's rotating clockwise. In order to get that, if your thumb points into, you know, down your fingers and also curl clockwise around this vector. And then similarly, um, omega of the pen uh, points downward in this case towards the arm if it's spinning with the direction that I drew for that little spinning arrow. Do, do, do. You rotate your physics books in your hands, identify at least three possible directions for omega and explain. So there's more than three, uh, but three that come to mind is I could have, say, omega point you know, to the right in which case the cover of the book would be kind of, you know, moving towards the screen and kind of rotating that way. I could have omega pointing through the book straight up, in which case then the book would be rotating kind of at it, on its base. Um, right, physics would always be readable. It wouldn't be upside down or anything at any point. Um, it'd be rotating, you know, through the spot, through the center of the book. You know, a third one could be that it could be rotating like this. Um, in which case, then the book is kind of rotating, you know, in a diagonal sense. You know, if you were to take the cover of the book and kind of spin it so that you're always seeing the word physics, but sometimes it's upside down, sometimes it's sideways, etc. And this is, of course, just three of, you know, essentially an infinite number that I could come up with. You know, I could have had the axis go not, you know, not through the center, but it could have gone, say, through the spine, in which case the entire book would have swung around that rotation axis. That's an example of another one. Rotational kinematics are the same as linear kinematics. What angular speed does the second hand, minute hand, and hour hand make on a clock? So the second hand is the one that goes around once a minute. Um, you might not have it if you have a clock that only has two hands, uh, but if you have a clock that has, you know, there are two hands that seem fairly stationary, and then there's one hand that's constantly sweeping around every minute, which is the second hand. Second as in it's measuring seconds, not it's the second hand of the two. <laughs> uh. So the idea with angular velocity is it's telling you how many, you know, how many radians do you traverse in a given amount of time, delta t. So the second hand, you know, would be it completes one full circle or two pi radians every 60 seconds. And that could be a way of, of specifying the angular velocity. I guess we could say the angular speed if we're not talking about direction was the angular speed of the second hand. The angular speed of the minute hand is that it does a full circle, uh, not every 60 seconds, but every hour. You know, so I could write, you know, omega for the minute hand is two pi divided by one hour, and then I could convert hours to seconds if I wanted um, and get a number in radians per second. And then the hour hand does two pi radians uh, per 12 hours for a 12 hour clock. It goes around in one full circle every 12 hours. A diver makes two and a half revolutions on the way from a 10 meter platform to the water. Assuming zero initial uh, vertical velocity, find the average angular velocity during the dive. So it seems like they just go plop um, but they're rotating as they do it. Now here the question is, is that it's some height above the, above the water. Uh, so for the first thing you might be, you might want to ask is 
how long does it take to get to the water? If it starts a height h above, it ends at zero, uh, which means I wrote that down wrong. It ends at zero, it started a height above, it had no initial velocity. The time it takes to get to the ground is then uh, 2h over g, all in the square root. And that's some number. And then for the angular, average angular velocity, um, the average angular velocity might be, you know, you can define that as omega final minus omega initial divided by the delta t that's elapsed. We just got a sense of what delta t was. We know the initial angular velocity was zero. Um, So I guess the question is, you know, what other information can we make use of here? I guess we don't know that the, ang the initial angular velocity was zero, but we essentially want to know, you know, what is delta omega over delta? Nope, this is all wrong, so wrong. Minus one for me. The average angular velocity is the change in theta over the change in time. You know, so in that case, it's theta final minus theta initial divided by the time that's elapsed. In this case, we now have a sense of what delta t is, and the top delta, uh, delta theta, is 2.5 revolutions over whatever this delta t is. But if we want to do this in radians, 2.5 revolutions is 2.5 times 2 pi radians over delta t. And then whatever that number is, is your average angular velocity. I was calculating before the average angular acceleration. My bad. Starting from, from rest, a disk rotates 25 radians in 5 seconds. If the angular acceleration is constant, what is it? What is the average angular velocity during this time? What is the instantaneous angular velocity at 5 seconds? So omega average, since we just did something like that, that's the easiest one we can do. You know, how, how many degrees did it move and how much amount of time? So in this case, we know 25 radians per five seconds. So five radians per second is the average angular velocity. Starting from rest is key because that, that means omega zero, omega naught is zero. Um, and if the angular acceleration is constant, that means that we can say omega final equals omega initial plus alpha t, and that theta final equals theta initial plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. This bottom expression says that delta theta equals one half alpha t squared since there's no initial angular velocity. T is then two theta, uh, sorry, we know T, we're looking for alpha. Uh, alpha is then two delta theta over T squared. We know two, we know delta theta, it's 25 radians, and we know that that occurred in five seconds. This can get, can get you a number for alpha. And then given alpha, we can plug that into the other kinematics expression and we can plug that in here. This is five seconds. This is zero. We can get the final angular velocity as a result. All right, rotational inertia and torque. Correct the statements below so they are true. Angular velocity points in a curve following the direction of rotating object, wrong. Angular velocity is a vector that points perpendicular to the rotation. If the object is rotating like I've drawn, then the angular velocity points perpendicular to that plane that that circle resides within. And you can think if the entire rotation is taking place on this sheet of paper, then omega uh, points perpendicular to that sheet of paper. And whether omega points up or down depends on the right-hand rule. Again, your thumb goes along omega, and then your fingers curl in the direction of, of rotation. 
Uh, so if it's as if I drew it on the left, then omega is drawn correctly. Uh, if it looks something like this, um, that is with omega pointing down, again, by the right-hand rule. In order for your fingers to curl like that, your thumb has to point down. Chinese medicine balls. So the idea is that you have a ball that's spinning on your finger. Uh, so it is spinning about this rotation axis. And then you have two balls, but let's just focus on one that's spinning in your hand. Um, and it's spinning about a different rotation, rotation axis where in this case, the ball is kind of just spinning in place like a rotating earth. Or in this case, the entire ball is swinging around the rotation axis. And this rotational inertia is greater than this one. The more that the mass is farther, more the mass that's farther away from the rotation axis, the higher the rotational inertia is. Angular acceleration always points towards the rotation axis, e.g. the center of the circle. Uh, not always. Uh, centripetal acceleration, you know, V squared over R, that always points towards the center of, of the circular motion. But that is the component that keeps the thing moving on a circle at a constant speed. If you have something that is speeding up, maybe it's rotating faster. You know, where this is V and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. That is a result of alpha, which is the tangential acceleration. It points tangent to the circle. So alpha in this case is always pointing, you know, it's trying to accelerate the object, you know, in some rotational direction. However, the way we write that is very similar to how we write omega. So if we have a circle that's rotating like this, we would say that omega points straight up by the right-hand rule. If it's also speeding up, the rotation that is, we would say that alpha also points in the same direction. This would be speeding up. Again, it is analogous to when we had, say, velocity and acceleration, linear acceleration, we would say that is speeding up. Velocity with an acceleration that points in the opposite direction is slowing down. Rotational inertia is maximized when more of the mass is located along the axis of rotation. Uh, I think I've already answered that. You know, it's wrong because it's when it's located farther away from the axis of rotation. You know, this sort of rotation is much harder to do than, say, the ball just rotating in place. A merry-go-round rotates from rest with angular acceleration of yada. How long does it take to rotate through the first two revolutions? So alpha is constant, so I can use the kinematic equations. I could write something like this. Another way I could write that is that omega final equals omega initial plus. It's starting from rest, so that's zero. We're given this. We're solving for t. Uh, we could set that equal to zero and set this equal to four pi. If it's the first two revolutions, it goes through one pi, two pi, that's one circle, and another two pi, that's two circles. And then you get some time that you can solve for. The second two revolutions, uh, one way to do this is you could say eight pi equals zero plus zero plus one half alpha t squared. So you could do the entire problem, but you're essentially asking how long does it take to go through four revolutions? Uh, you know, and this would give you, you know, t, of, t through the first four revolutions. And then the second two uh, revolutions would be the difference of these two answers. If you wanted to do a similar kinematics equation where you might say, okay, four pi revolutions, you just have to be careful because your initial angular acceleration is not zero in that case. You know, after two pi, after two revolutions at four pi radians, 
uh, it has spun up. It has some angular velocity that you could you would need to plug in in order to get the answer correct by that method. All right, uh, centripetal acceleration. If the space station has a radius of two kilometers, what is the angular velocity? What angular velocity does the space station have? All right, so it's undergoing uniform circular motion with a centripetal acceleration, which is v squared over r, uh, but we want to be approximately equal to in magnitude g. This then allows us to get a velocity as just the square root of gr. So that is the linear velocity that someone on the edge of the space station is experiencing. Then you can use the connection that v is also omega r, uh, where r in this case is the radius of the space station. So the velocity of someone at the edge of the space station you know, so we plug in capital R because that's where its radius location is. Uh, those are connected by the angular velocity that the space station has. Everywhere on the space station has the same angular velocity, no matter where they are in the center, um, rotating in place, you know, at the very edge, somewhere in between. But it allows you to then get what the angular velocity is. How long does it take the station to make one full rotation? This is the period we saw with circular motion. You know, it has to go through two pi r or one circumference moving at some velocity v. You could do it that way. Or we just said that v is omega times r. So we could think of this as omega times r, the r's cancel. An equivalent statement, again, also one we'll see when we do oscillations, is that the period of rotation is two pi divided by omega. You know, it's trying to do two pi radians worth of, of angular motion. This is how fast it's traversing, you know, ang angles, um, how many radians per second it's traversing. Uh, so it's kind of the same sort of geometric argument. You're rolling various objects, which makes it to the bottom first. All right, so the idea is you have something that's rolling down a ramp and it has some moment of inertia I. The moment of inertia is always something that looks like km r squared for something that has some radius r. Sometimes other things pop in, but generally it's something like km r squared. I think I have, yes. You know, in this case, it's just m r squared, one half m r squared, one half, one twelfth m l squared, where it's this length that matters. When both the length and the radius matter, they both contribute in a sense mr squared with a two-fifths, two-thirds mr squared, mr squared by one-half, etc. So the idea here is that um, rotational energy is just one way of, is just one component of kinetic energy. Something that's both rolling and uh, moving has both rotational motion and kinetic, you know, linear translational motion. Uh, it's both going somewhere down the ramp and it's also rotating as it does it. So since this is a frictionless, well, this is not, well, this actually is not a frictionless ramp, but friction is not doing any work in this case um, because of the rolling. Uh, we can apply conservation of energy. So we can say that the initial total energy k plus u equals the final k plus u, which in this case is saying it's mgh equals one half mv squared plus one half i omega squared. And whichever object has the larger velocity v is the one that makes it to the bottom first. Now I can write omega, um, I could get, instead of omega, I can replace that uh, in this case with V over R. 
Um, and then you can solve an expression for V that's going to depend on I in some way. Um, if you want to even be cl more clever, you can use the fact that I is KMR squared. So in this case, it's 1 half MV squared plus 1 half KMR squared times V squared over R squared, which is kind of nice because then the R squares cancel. And this looks like it says 1 half m plus km v squared or something like that. I could have, I could have factored out the m as well. And that equals m g h. There's an m everywhere so I can get rid of the m's. So then this just looks like 2 g h 1 plus k equals v squared. Uh, so in this case larger velocities mean lower values of k. I want that denominator to be small. Uh, so the objects that have the lower rotational inertia make it to the bottom first, which is why the solid object makes it to the ground first before the hoop. The more mass that's farther away from the rotation axis, the harder it is to get that thing rolling. Uh, so more of that energy that it has, that potential energy that it has, has to go into rotation rather than actual linear motion. Oh, I guess I skipped one. Uh, this one, it's essentially, you can write down that it has some rotational energy, some rotational kinetic energy. And then going back to our discussion of power, power is essentially saying it's how energy is changing with time. So you could write something like delta K over delta T. Uh, so if you think that it starts with this much kinetic energy and it ends with no kinetic energy, that gives you delta K. I think the problem tells you, right, eight kilowatts. If the rate it uses is eight kilowatts, right? So the rate here is P and then you can solve for delta T. All right, four beads on a string are shown below. Find the rotational inertia. So rotational inertia is the sum of the mass for you when you have point particles, when you don't have extended objects like spheres or hoops or whatnot. You can just do the sum of the particles, which is the mass of each particle times the perpendicular distance it is from the rotation axis. So in the case of member three, I can look at the distance that each of these particles is from the rotation axis. Add up all the mr squareds and I will get some sort of number. So in this case, I might be something like, let's see, particle one has mass m and it looks like it is a distance of uh, three halves l uh, and that's being squared. The second particle from the left looks like it has a mass m and it's half an L away squared. The third particle is L over two on the other side squared. And then the fourth particle is three L over two squared. So then let's see, that's like nine, 18, 19, 20. So this looks like it's 20 m L squared over four. Or, um, uh, let's see, so I guess 20 divided by 4 is 5, so 5 ml squared. Versus, say, member 4, where it's measuring the distance to a different rotation axis, where one of the particles is located on the rotation axis, so it does not contribute anything to the rotational inertia. So in that case, I would be, let's see, the one on the left is 2L away. So it looks like it's 2L squared. The second one is a distance L away. The third one is on the rotation axis. And then the fourth one is a distance L away. So let's see, four, five, six. So this looks like something like 6ML squared. Doop. 
All right, so um, now the idea with the parallel axis theorem is if you know the rotation, if you know the moment of inertia through the center of mass of the system, and you want to instead calculate what is the rotational inertia through some new rotation axis, Right, so instead of it spinning in place, right, it's spinning you know, around you know, like that. You can still do that. Um, you could either reevaluate, <coughs> you could reevaluate the, the sum like we did like you did in the previous problem, or you can use the parallel axis theorem. So the center of mass, the rotational inertia for the center of mass, is member three. So in that case, it was five ml squared. And so for member four, the idea is it can find its new rotational inertia by taking five ml squared and multiply and adding to it rather the total mass four m times the square of the shift. You know, so the old rotation axis shifted to the new rotation axis which is it's shifted by L over two in this case. If we go back up, it shifts from here to here in a distance of L over two. So notice in that case, it's five ML squared plus four ML squared over four. The fours cancel, you get six ML squared, which is good because that's exactly what we uh, expected to get when we did this by hand. They should, owe, they should agree. The two methods should obviously agree with one another. For extended objects like spheres and hoops and whatnot, the bottom approach, the rotation axis shift through the parallel axis theorem uh, is usually much, much easier than just adding up all the particles. Because usually then that means you have to do an integral uh, for extended objects. All right, a bent arm holding up a physics textbook feels a torque only from the textbook's weight. Uh, so not quite. So there is indeed a torque because the book is pushing down on your arm. Uh, and your arm is going to rotate around your elbow uh, if allowed. So in that case, there is a torque because the elbow to where the book is Right, that is the moment arm. There's the force from the book touching your hand. It's not, you know, if the book's not moving, it is just the weight of the book, mg, but remember, that doesn't have to be the case. It's the fact that there's a contact force between the book and your hand, uh, pushing your hand down, which is equal to mg if you're holding it stationary. Else, if there's an acceleration, it's not going to be the, that case. Again, you can imagine putting a little bathroom scale underneath your hand and asking what is that, you know, the bathroom scale is measuring the, the contact force. But anyway, um, this book is exerting a torque. I could do the right hand rule for torque, which is R cross F. You know, my right hand fingers point first along R, then bend down towards the bottom of the page, you know, which is the direction of the force. Uh, the book has a torque that points uh, into the page in that case. It wants to make your arm rotate, you know, in the clockwise direction. There is also the weight of your arm. So the weight of your arm has some weight um, from gravity pulling down in your arm. And your arm is not all located at your elbow. So there's again a torque uh, which points into the page as a result. And maybe that's it. Uh, in both of those cases, your arm is going to, you know, flop downwards in the clockwise direction. If you're holding the book and it's stationary, something must be balancing these two torques. You know, the F equals MA, torque equals rotational inertia times angular acceleration. If your arm is staying stationary and not rotating at all, there must be something balancing these two torques. In which case it may, in this case, it is your bicep. And your bicep is not located at your elbow. So there is some moment arm and then it's exerting some tension force through your muscles and tendons 
uh, to torque your, you know, that is torquing your uh, arm upwards. So it's trying to make your arm rotate in the counterclockwise direction. And if nothing's moving, uh, all of those will be in balance. Static equilibrium results when the net force on an object is zero. That's a good start. You know, the, there's no net force and there's no net torque. Um, and if we really want to be nitpicky, the fact that I said static also suggests that omega and V are also zero. Nothing is moving and nothing gets moving. Uh, is the criterion for equilibrium. Static equilibrium then also requires that everything is stationary as well. And this must be true in any coordinate system or for any axis of rotation. You could specify the axis of rotation be whatever you want and measure the torques from that axis uh, and you will and you better get zero. The cross product does not commute. Uh, you can see this by the right hand rule. Uh, if you take, you know, if you have this be R and this be F, um, and then I could redraw it um, where, where I first do F and then I do R. As a vector sum, I, add, I end up in the same place, but this isn't a vector sum, this is a vector product, the cross product. You know, I could start with my fingers towards R, along R rather, and then they sweep down towards F. In this case, the cross product points into the page. Or I could then do it the other direction where I put my fingers first along F and then sweep them towards R. In that case, the cross product points out of the page. And it turns out same magnitude, opposite direction. Pumping rolls down a ramp along angular acceleration, primarily through gravity. So in this case, uh, this is to get you thinking about what actually is causing the pumpkin to rotate uh, or roll. And something has to be torquing the pumpkin in order to get it to roll. It's not gravity. Because gravitational torque occurs as if the object were, you know, you could take the object's center of mass and put all the mass there and then evaluate the force due to gravity at the center of mass. But in the case of a, we a wheel or a pumpkin or whatnot, that is also where the axis of rotation is. So there's no moment arm in that case. So gravity is not torquing the pumpkin in this instance. So what is actually doing it here, you know, what is actually torquing up the pumpkin is that there has to be some friction between the pumpkin and the ramp. If you have a, a wheel or a pumpkin that's rotating like this, something had to get it spinning that way. Um, and a way to do that is if there's a torque from friction that is pointing in the opposite direction. This is force of friction. It's rotating here about the rotation axis. So this is the moment arm. Again, the cross product, fingers point down, then they sweep over to F. In that case, the torque points into the page which results in, uh, or the desire is then an angular acceleration that is clockwise or angular velocity that ultimately is clockwise. Consider the following setups, figure out the cross product. All right, so R cross F, this is into the page. This is zero because they're parallel. Um, R cross F, this is you know, straight up. And then R cross F, it's kind of, you know, more or less towards the right, you know, a little bit kind of, uh, you know, towards the back, you know, I guess in a sense. Um, a good thing to remember is that R and F, um, I guess they don't do perpendicular. If you have some R and you have some F, the cross product, whatever it is, will always be perpendicular to both of them. The cross product is perpendicular to the original two vectors always. And you can kind of see it, you know, in these cases. Um, you know, the cross product there is pointing straight up, which is perpendicular to both of them. Here, this is out of the or into the page. 
Uh, so in both those cases, since F and R are on the plane of the page, uh, that's also perpendicular. Baton with two point masses are at the ends of a one meter beam. What is the rotational inertia of the baton about the pivot? So the idea with the baton is that we can ignore the mass of the rod itself, um, else you would have to include that. So in this case, the rotational inertia is just the sum of the masses times the square of the distance they are from the pivot point or the rotation axis, which is here. Uh, I guess it's not really straight up. I guess it's more just a pivot point here. Because it's either gonna rotate, you know, in some way around, you know, that pivot point. So in this case, both the masses are the same. So then it looks like one is 0.2 meters squared away. Then one is 0.8 meters squared away. So whatever that is. Right, because if it's if it's one overall and this is 0.2 meters, then this better be 0.8 meters. And then M is, I guess I don't give it to you. What is the net torque? So in this case, the ball on the left, gravity is pulling down on it. And there is some moment arm from the pivot point. That's 0.2 meters. And then F, F sub G is just MG. If I do the cross product of for the torque, R cross F, my thumb points out of the page with a magnitude that is mg times 0.2 meters. And in this case, we would say it's positive um, by the convention that counterclockwise motion is um, positive, clockwise motion is considered negative. Just the convention, that is just the convention of uh, how you treat these vectors. Why is this counterclockwise motion? You know, you could just imagine, if you were to imagine that baton, if there was only the pumpkin on the left and the pumpkin on the right was not there, there would be more, there'd be mass on the left side of the pivot and the thing's gonna wanna fall, you know, the, the pumpkin's gonna wanna fall down on the left. And so it's as if the entire thing is rotating counterclockwise if that were to happen. Similarly, for the pumpkin on the right, there is also a force due to gravity and a moment arm. In that case, that torque points into the page with a magnitude that I would say is negative mg times 0 0.8 meters. Negative because it wants to make the entire thing rotate in this direction, you know, if there was nothing else stopping it. So then it looks like T net is negative 0 0.6 mg, the sum of the two. Here the signs matter, torque is a vector. Newton's second law says the sum of the torques is I, I alpha, or that alpha is the sum of the torques divided by I. And the previous two parts just helped you to get each of those terms. So something like that. And here, notice the M's cancel and you can actually get a number of whatever that is. It's negative overall, because of that overall negative sign. That negative sign overall implies that ultimately what's gonna happen for this baton is it's gonna wanna rotate clockwise. That comes about because if the torque is ultimately pointing into the page, then what you're solving for is alpha, which we just said was negative. So alpha also points into the page, uh, which means you know eventually it's going to want to make omega point into the page after a certain amount of time. You know if omega is 
alpha delta t or something like that. Uh, since there was no rotation initially, you know, again, this is back to chapter four, three, whatnot. You know, there was no initial velocity, in this case, angular velocity. So the acceleration is going to create an angular velocity vector that is parallel to it. And then the object will rotate faster and faster, you know, as time passes. All right, Newton's second law, but for a pulley. So looking at the pulley on the left, there is a force that acts on the pulley, which we define to be the location of the point of contact with the rope and the uh, pulley itself. The rest of the rope essentially just becomes part of the pulley and is rotating with the pulley. Uh, that is the idea behind no slipping, uh, if, you're, if you were reading about that in the book. And there's indeed a torque because the thing wants to rotate about the center of the pulley. Um, so there is a moment arm uh, and a force. The torque in this case, since these are, you know, the torque in general is R F sine of the angle between them in magnitude. The, so the angle between them is 90 degrees. So this is just going to be the radius of the pulley times the force that's being applied and since this wants to rotate in the clockwise direction, we throw a negative sign in front of it. Because again, the torque is pointing into the page in this case. So that's the only torque in the system. So I could say that torque equals I alpha for the, um, for the pulley. But now I need to know what I is for the pulley. And in this case, uh, this is what represents uh, cylinders or disks about the central axis. Because uh, notice that the, the value of L never plays a role in, in the actual answer. It doesn't matter what L is. L could be very small, it could be very large. So this is representative of disks, uh, like pulleys, for example. So then I can write minus RF equals one half M r squared times alpha and one of the r's cancel it looks like alpha then is negative 2f divided by by m r whatever that is it's negative which suggests that it also points into the page uh, which is then going to result in clockwise rotation or that's what it desires and since the pulley wasn't moving initially, that's what the pulley will do. If the pulley was already moving counterclockwise, this would say that first the pulley is going to slow down and then it might turn around. All right, uh, number five is the same thing. You're just solving for I instead. All right, the weight of the world. Now this problem doesn't really make sense because weight depends on some sort of gravity. Um, and we're considering the earth itself as the object. So I'm not sure what we're, you know, the lever is allowing us to move against its weight. Um, I'm not quite sure, right, where this weight is arising from. I guess the weight of the earth around the sun, maybe, if the sun is below the lever. So the idea here is if you wanted to move the earth, um, one way you could do that is say if you wanted to move the earth with some constant angular velocity um, you know so there, there would be no acceleration necessarily or angular acceleration you would just be rotating the earth up at a constant rate on the lever and so if alpha equals zero that also means that the net torque on the system is zero So the question is, is, if I wanted to move the Earth, I should consider the net torque on, on the system. And if that's equal to zero, then I might be able to get some relationship of what L needs to be if I'm pushing down with a given force of 100 Newtons. So in this case, the axis of rotation is there. There's a moment arm out to me, and then I'm pushing down with some force. 
And then similarly, there's a moment arm out to the earth, and then the earth is pushing down with some force, which you know, I guess is its, its weight. Um, uh, and then it is a distance, I guess, r, the rays of the earth away. These are in opposite directions. My motion wants to make the earth rotate, I guess, counterclockwise. So this might be the torque there, since everything is at 90 degrees. The forces are at 90 degrees with the moment arms. You know, LF minus radius of the earth weight equals zero in that case. So then L would have to be something like radius of the earth, the weight of the earth, um, divided by the force I'm applying. So make L big enough and the force could be as small as you want it to be. Um, or in this case for knowing you're only able to provide a given force, here's the L that's necessary. Unsurprisingly, it's pretty big, but uh, this nonetheless makes it possible for you to do something like this. It's the whole idea behind why levers are useful. It's really just torque. All right, consider this balance beam set up below, and it's asking for equilibrium. Uh, well, it's in equilibrium, what forces are being exerted by the two balances? So I did a problem like this in lecture, but the idea is that if you're in equilibrium, that means that you can add up all the torques and it better equal zero for any axis of rotation. Any axis of rotation that you're considering, you can evaluate the torques about that axis of rotation. And it needs to add up to zero no matter what you choose. So the idea is you could first start by saying this is my axis of rotation that I'm going to measure all my torques from. In that case, the weight of the pumpkin head, you know, it has some weight that's pulling down, but it's a distance, you know, some distance away from the axis of rotation. The board itself has some weight, which is also pushing down. But then there's this other, uh, um, pivot or whatnot, or the balance that has some moment arm, and then it has a force that's pushing up on the on the board, or the balance beam. All right. So again, it's there's a, some contact force between the balance beam and the and the balance on the right. There's some contact force between the pumpkin head and the bal and the balance beam. If everything's in equilibrium, it's just the weight of the pumpkin head. And then there's the weight of the beam itself. And if I calculate what these three torques are, they better add up to zero. And the nice thing is, is that even though there's a contact force with the left balance in the board, it does not exert a torque for this axis of rotation. This particular axis of rotation places that balance right at, um, you know, where there's no moment arm in this case. So from this axis of rotation, it's as if no torque is being exerted. So in this case, the pumpkin head, uh, I would say is minus M pumpkin times G times the distance it's away from the left, the left balance, which looks like I just called it X. I wrote a negative sign because it wants, because if that was the only thing uh, acting on the beam, it would rotate clockwise, you know, about about the um, about my current selection of pivot point. There's also the mass of the board times G times the distance it is away from the uh, from the left pivot, which looks like given the symbols, it looks like it's something like delta X over two. And then there is the torque from the right balance, which is going to be plus whatever that force is. And then it is a distance, looks like delta x away. And then this better equal zero. And we don't know this, that's what we're hoping to find. 
but I believe I give you what delta x is, we know g, and I give you what the masses are. And do I give you x? Yes, I do, good. So in that case, you know everything except, and you can solve for what force uh, that right balance is uh, exerting in order to keep everything stationary. Then the idea is that you can do it again, but now I'm gonna put my axis of rotation here. Why? So that then that second balance, that right balance um, from this axis of rotation does not exert any torque. I could have done something differently because now we actually do know the, the amount of force that's being exerted by that balance. Uh, but in this case, we don't need to know, you know, the way I'm doing it, we won't need to know it at all. So in this case, there's a moment arm and then the force from the person. There's the weight of the board. And then there's the uh, restoring torque from the other pivot. In this case, it looks like the board is M board G, again, delta X over two. Um, but I'm going to write that as a plus sign because the it's wants things to rotate like this, you know, the two forces that are pointing down are going to be positive torques this time, and the balance is going to be a negative torque. There's the pumpkin person times G, and it is a distance, uh, looks like delta X minus X away from the, from the green dot. And then there is the balance, you know, N2, if this is n1, and then it is a distance delta x away. And those torques better add up to zero. And again, we know everything except n sub 2. We can solve for n sub 2. All right, and then 8 is more of the same, so I'm not going to do that. All right. First, first problem, the cross product. Um, so it's asking you to uh, first figure out if this is clockwise or counterclockwise motion. So I could imagine if that dotted line I drew was actually a string attached to that black ball. You know, it would, you know, this would want to rotate like this, or this would want to rotate like this, if it were constrained by a rope, say. So in this case, it looks like this is clockwise. This is counterclockwise, this is clockwise, and this is counterclockwise. Now, it might not actually be moving in a circle, but that's okay, uh, because that tendency, that it appears like it's going generally in the clockwise or the counterclockwise direction, is enough to define what omega is. Omega must then point either such that it appears like it's rotating clockwise or appears like it's rotating counterclockwise. So then I would say, what, me what vector omega corresponds to clockwise rotation? So again, this is the right-hand rule. Your fingers curl in the direction of rotation and your thumb points along omega. So your fingers have to curl in the clockwise direction, which I can only do if my thumb points into the page. So then I would say that's into the page. This is into the page. And as a result, counterclockwise, uh, the only way I can make my th I can do curl that with my fingers and have my thumb uh, point, or have my fingers curl counterclockwise, I can only do that if my thumb points on the page. Now I claim that omega always points in the same direction as omega, or L, angular momentum, always points in the same direction as omega. You could just take that as a given, or you could evaluate the cross product and convince yourself that if I do R cross P, I do get a vector that points either into or out of the page. So in this, in the first case, you know, you have some moment arm R, and then you have some direction of the momentum P. So if I stick my fingers along R and then curl them downward, indeed, my thumb points into the page for these, and my thumb points out of the page for these. Linear momentum 
it's asking what happens after some amount of time delta t for each of these momentum vectors for the given force. The thing to remember is that momentum is parallel to V, force is parallel to A. So if it's more helpful for you to think of that this is, you know, some velocity vector V and the force results in some acceleration vector A, in this case, what's going to happen is that the, so, you know, this is, you know, what we saw in chapter three, four, whatnot, of speeding up, no direction change. Similarly, this is slowing down with no direction change. Unless delta t is large enough, in that case, the momentum might go to zero and it might turn around. But for if delta t is small enough, uh, you know, what's going to immediately happen here is that the object is going to slow down a little. And then in this case, where they're initially both perp where the force and the momentum are perpendicular to one another, that's more like circular motion. So in this case, the momentum vector is going to tend to want to sweep towards F. And that is generally true. You know, things can be speeding up and slowing down and changing directions. It can be changing in both magnitude and direction. That's fine. Um, but given enough time, you know, if delta, if delta T is long enough, if you wait long enough, eventually the momentum vector will sweep over and point parallel to the direction of F. Um, if you give F enough time to really change the motion, uh, it will become parallel uh, with how the force is being applied. So if the direction of F is never changing for both these cases, uh, eventually P will become parallel given enough time. Then the idea here is that for number three, everything we just said about number two um, is analogous with torque and angular momentum. So in this case, uh, since L is always parallel to omega and torque is always parallel to angular acceleration, this is again the same thing as saying you have some angular velocity vector and some angular acceleration that's pointing in the same direction. And so by analogy, what's happening is that omega grows in magnitude with no direction change. But what does that mean? The object might not necessarily be moving. Um, all that means is that the rotation speeds up. Remember, omega doesn't point in the direction of rotation. You have to use the right-hand rule. Your fingers curl in the direction of rotation. Your thumb points along omega. But if omega is getting larger, that means the angular velocity is increasing. That means the thing is spinning faster. And so similarly, this is an example of spinning down. The angular momentum is decreasing, so omega is decreasing. As a result, uh, the amount of spin reduces. And in these cases, again, given enough time, the torque will want to make the angular momentum vector point in the same direction as the torque. Completely analogous to what we did with number two. You know, forces want to pull momentum to point in the same direction. Torques want to pull angular momentum to point in the same direction given enough time. So in this case, what's happening uh, is that the direction of rotation is somewhat moving. The thing is still rotating around L. That part doesn't change, but L itself is pointing in a different direction. So, you know, this could be a case where you spin a ball around on a string above your head, but then you slowly but surely, while keeping it spinning, rotate it so that it's spinning out in front of you rather than around your head. You know, there you, you, the object is still spinning, but you've changed the direction of the angular velocity uh, through torquing the system. All right, the top. Um, 
if we assume there's no friction with the floor, um, we don't have to worry about friction slowing the top down. So in this case, by the right hand rule, if omega is pointing straight up, my thumb points straight up, my fingers curl around my thumb, uh, this looks like it's kind of counterclockwise rotation of the top, which has some angular velocity or some angular momentum in this case. Gravity is acting on the top, but it is not exerting a torque that makes it want to fall over. If you're thinking of the top and asking if it's going to fall over or not, it falls over because it rotates about a point at the bottom where the top touches the ground. That is the quote unquote axis of rotation if we're asking if the object is going to fall over or not. And then there is some, and then the center of mass is located directly above it here. So in the case of torque, since again, torque is just moment arm cross F. I could say, okay, my moment arm goes from the axis of rotation up to where the force is being applied. And then if it's gravity, since gravity is applied at the center of mass, gravity then points straight down from the center of mass. In this case, the angle between them is 180 degrees. The torque as a result is zero. Sine of 180 degrees is zero. So I would say there's no torque, L is conserved, uh, L is conserved or L remains a constant, the top remains spinning forever. In the second case, there is a torque because it's kind of off now on its side. In this case, whether it falls over or not depends on whether it rotates about the axis of rotation at the bottom where the base touches the ground. We can intuitively imagine what happens if I were to set up the top like this and let go of the top and it's not spinning, it's just going to plop over to the right. We should be able to argue and understand why. Physics should say that it should rotate and fall over to the right. So in this case, there is a moment arm that goes out to where the force is being applied due to gravity, and then gravity is pointing straight down. So there's a moment arm and there's a force due to gravity. That results in a torque. In this case, they're not parallel or anti-parallel. The torque is not zero. If I do the right-hand rule, this gives me a torque that points into the page and is non-zero. I can then think back to the previous page where we said that given enough time, torque will pull the angular momentum vector to point in the same direction as the torque. But in this case, there is no angular momentum vector. So therefore, an angular momentum vector is created that starts at zero and just grows parallel to the torque vector. So eventually L is also just parallel uh, to the torque vector and points into the page. Or similarly, that means omega points into the page since they are parallel to one another. And if you think about it, if you point your thumb into the page and then curl your fingers around, you know, something that goes into the page, you know, it, you know with your right hand fingers uh, curl in the clockwise direction which again is showing that the angular velocity is going to have it rotate in the clockwise direction and then eventually just plop over and hit the ground. For these cases, we don't have to redo this. There's still a torque. Uh, nothing changes about that. But now there's already an angular momentum vector that's pointing kind of diagonally to the right. So in this case, you have, try to draw it 3D, you have some angular momentum vector and then you have some torque vector that points into the page uh, while L itself, the angular momentum, is kind of along the page. So what, 
wants to happen here is that L wants to slowly but surely twist to move over to point in the same direction as the torque. So as a result, the top precesses, or the entire top, while spinning very rapidly, the entire top very slowly moves uh, you know, into the page. You can Google precession of a top. I'm sure you know, there are hundreds of videos, I'm sure, exist showing this. Um, and you probably have experienced this if you had a top as a kid. You know, the top itself, if it's spinning at an angle, you know, it's spinning very rapidly, but the entire top seems to be swirling around in a circle. And the reason that happens is because the torque vector is pointing perpendicular to L. So then L starts to move to point in the same direction as the torque. But then because the top has moved, the moment arm has moved. And so the torque is also continuously changing directions. So every time, the, every time L moves to point in the same direction as the torque vector, the torque vector also rotates a little bit. So the angular momentum is constantly chasing after the torque vector. It constantly is trying to point in the same direction. Uh, but the torque vector is always kind of rotating up ahead of it. So that's called precession. And then similarly for the fourth case, but in the opposite direction. All right, no, no, no one made it to number five, um, so we will likely do this uh, in class, but I can walk through it real quick right now and then I'll stop. An ice skater is skating in a straight line, runs into this rod, grabs a hold of the rod, and then begins to rotate with the rod, you know, in this case you can imagine, in a counterclockwise direction once the collision occurs. Similar to momentum conservation, you can do angular momentum conservation right before and right after the collision. So the idea is that you have to write down the total angular momentum initially and then set that equal to the total angular momentum at the final point. So uh, the tricky part then is just to identify what is the angular momentum right before the collision and then the angular momentum, I guess, right after the collision, where it's starting to move, um, where then the rod and the person start to move as one, where initially the person is moving with some velocity, the person has some momentum, right before it touches the rod and starts to interact with the rod. So if I define my system as person and rod, then all of these torques and, and force interactions are internal to the system and I can say angular momentum is conserved, just like how I could have said regular momentum is conserved. So the goal is to write what is L, the total angular momentum right before the collision, and then what is L right after the collision. The rod has no angular momentum about this green dot, which I'm specifying as my axis of rotation. Again, I can do this to any axis of rotation. I'm going to do the one that seems obvious and makes sense. The rod is not rotating at all. It has no angular momentum. The person, while they're moving in a straight line, and I would not necessarily think of that as rotation, from the point of view of the axis of rotation, that green dot, it appears like the person is, is about to move in a counterclockwise rotation, right? It's moving in the direction that's consistent with counterclockwise motion. So the, um, the axis of rotation would measure that it does have some angular momentum. That person does have some angular momentum, which in this case is uh, the moment arm cross the linear momentum of the person. All right, that is the definition of angular momentum for a point particle, and we're going to treat the person as a point particle. So since the momentum is perpendicular to the moment arm, the angle between them is 90 degrees, so I can write this just as L, M, V, M person, V person. Uh, sine of 90 is 1. And then this is clockwise, I'm oh, sorry, counterclockwise motion, so I'm going to consider that as the positive direction.
the final angular momentum is now the rod and the person are moving as one. So you can think of it as a, a single unit thing of just you know a rod that has some mass and length and then a blob of extra mass that's lumped on to the end. So this is L, big M, and then this is little m. So this is some weird kind of weirdish shaped general extended object. So I could, if I wanted to, write down the final angular momentum as the total rotational inertia of the system times the final angular velocity, um, which I then want to evaluate. Um, you know, the final angular velocity is what I want, uh, but I need to first calculate what is the rotational inertia of the system. So in this case, it is it is the rod with the axis of rotation, you know, at the end, plus the person who is at a distance that is also a distance l away from the axis of rotation. So we have to find our table, and we have this case here where it's saying you have a thin rod that has some length l and some mass m and it's 1 12th ml squared but you have to be careful because here it has the axis of rotation going through the center of the rod we want it to be going through the edge of the rod but that's okay because we could always then use the parallel axis theorem to shift our rotation axis so 1 12th ml squared so for the rod, the rotation axis was 1 12th big M L squared, but then I'm shifting the rotation axis. So I take the total mass of the rod times the square of the length of the shift, which was half the length of the rod squared. That shifts my rotation axis to the edge of the rod. And then the person itself is M L squared in its contribution to the rotational inertia. So then L initial equals L final implies L initial is M person, V person uh, times big L. And then that equals the total inertia, rotational inertia of the system. So you got the person and then you got the rod. And then it all has some final angular velocity. And the idea is I give you, yes, I give you everything in this case uh, except the angular velocity. So then you can solve to calculate how fast the thing is rotating. Person plus rod is rotating as a result. All right, and these problems we will look at again uh, in our next meeting.